Well, that thing's a turd. Have you guys ever had one of those weeks where you just struggle to get anything done? You know, and you, you sure do your damnedest. But things just don't go as planned. This happens to be one of those weeks. You know, I've got a laundry list of things to do. I'm going to end up losing my weekend to Rensport. That's a pretty big Porsche event. I'm not actually going to go. But I'm going to go meet up with some buddies out there and then just hang out around Monterey. This is for a friend of mine. This is one of the cylinder heads off of his 2UZ FE engine. He's been chasing a weird tick. He ended up replacing one head and it ended up getting worse. You've got to be conscious about this, how this gear assembly works. Essentially, this front half of the gear is spring-loaded, and you've got to preload it one direction. Uh, when you disassemble these, you've got to put this bolt in place so you don't lose all your spring tension. He didn't do that. He was chasing a weird tick. Some of it ended up being valve lash related. And then I think he introduced a new problem by not putting this bolt into place on disassembly. Toyotas are really special. I'll show you exactly what makes these a little more complicated than normal. Uh, they use a shim under bucket design that's pretty typical Yamaha Toyota. That most commonly you'll see that in motorcycles or dirt bikes. I told him I'd check the valve lash and we could adjust it a hell of a lot faster on my bench than you could on the engine. So that's what we're doing right now. Off the top of my head I want to say valve lash spec for a Toyota V8, especially of this vintage early 2000s late 90s is uh, six to ten thousandths on the intake and then ten to fourteen thousandths on the exhaust. His intakes were right at the upper limit. Nothing wrong with that. We got a bunch of tens, some nines, uh, some more tens. I'm okay with that. The exhaust on the other hand, if your range is ten to fourteen, we've got a seventeen there. Few at the upper limit. Here's a sixteen. And I think that was it for the ones that were out of spec. We've got two here that are fairly loose. Would that make a highly audible tick? I'm not entirely sure. Uh, this thing was a little scary looking when it came in. There was this reddish tinge to the exhaust ports and all the chambers. I kept asking them, you know, do you have any check engine lights? Did it blow a head gasket? No, no, no. And then eventually after enough digging, he did reveal that this thing has long tube headers and computers on these are kind of hard to tune. You know, there's some devices that you can buy to trick the computer into adding more fuel, but that's probably about it. Uh, these days, I think you can buy some piggyback devices that allow a little bit more tunability on these older Toyotas. I'm sure that has everything to do with what I think is a lean condition you know it's funny he might actually go through all this effort put this head back on one head will have corrected valve lash he'll fix this gear lash issue the other head will still be the same old used untouched 140,000 mile head by the sounds of things i could almost guarantee you that the tick is still going to be there because i've got a suspicion that his issue was an exhaust leak you no, know, and I could be wrong. I don't see any evidence of it. But that wouldn't be surprising. An exhaust leak does sound a lot like a valve tick. But that's not my problem. All I know is what I can see on the bench. This was a pretty typical design for Toyotas up until the mid-2000s. They were pretty much all over a cam. They used a bucket that went between the valves and the camshafts. And they had some form of an adjustment method. This is a shim over bucket design. Basically, all of these were the same thickness. And you adjusted the valves by changing the thickness of this puck on the top, which is removable. Uh, the benefit to this was you were able to adjust the valves without pulling the camshafts off. There were some factory tools that allowed you to push the valve spring down, push the lifter down. You're able to take a little pocket pry bar and pry the shim out of the lifter and then install your new one to make your adjustment. Toyota used this shim over bucket design for a very long time. 
the earliest examples would have been early 80s, late 70s, and the most recent would have been, I believe, 2005 or 2006 with the death of the 2JZ. While all the other engines in the Toyota lineup use an updated style of lifter, they continued to use the shim over bucket design in the 2JZ. Now in the early 2000s, I believe the first example of this would have been 2001 or 1999. Toyota did go away from the shim over bucket design to a shim under bucket design. I want to say that the first example of this would have been the VVTi version of the 1UZ. Uh, that would have been LS400. And then every single truck engine... A uh, 4.7 liter 2UZFE would have used a shim under bucket design as well. On the older engines, the shim was on top of the bucket. And on the newer ones, this bucket became completely solid. That helped save a lot of valve train weight. This is about what they would have looked like. And then the shim shrunk in diameter. And they sat inside a little recess inside of the retainer. And to adjust your valves, you'd pull the cams off, pull your buckets out. And you change the thickness of your adjustment shims accordingly, reassemble, recheck your valve lash, and repeat in case you needed to make some last minute changes. This was a better design. But it did add some complications to service. Uh, thankfully, these things tend to stay pretty true to their original settings, so you don't have to get into them very often. I think the service interval would have been every 60,000 miles, you'd have to take the valve covers off and check the valve lash. And if they didn't need adjustment, then you'd leave it alone and then recheck on the next interval. Now in other engines, Toyota went away from the adjusting shim altogether, and they used a solid lifter, a lot like this, and did away with all the complication of having extra parts, all the extra weight, and this really is the best version of this design. Except not only do you have to disassemble the whole top of your engine to adjust your valve lash, now, whereas before you had to buy a 4 or $5 adjusting shim, now you're purchasing $25 a piece lifters, or buckets, or cam followers, whatever you feel like calling them. That got a little bit costly. Later on, Toyota went away with, from this design altogether, and they used a finger follower with a roller and went to a hydraulic top end. Uh, that was probably a little bit more expensive, but it did make the valve trains a hell of a lot quieter, and it took away the uh, serviceability shortcomings that came with a solid, adjustable valve train. And fun fact, Nissan used a solid, non-adjustable lifter a lot like this in every single VQ engine. And not only did you have to do a per periodic valve adjustment check, you'd also have to tear them down because they had oiling problems and they would the camshafts would eat the top of these lifters and you'd have a failure. I will say pretty much every other manufacturer that uses a bucket style lifter like this don't have those problems, but Nissan is Nissan. Eh. Not the best designs in the world. I did hear that Nissan no now knows how to design an oiling system. I have some friends of mine who have made entire careers out of fixing Nissan oiling systems and redesigning their engines. Now I've gone ahead and ground all of these valves. That shrunk the valve lash number and what I'm going to have to do to adjust this on the bench is I'm going to have to grind just a little bit off the valve tips. Once this is assembled and keepers are installed, I'll go ahead and put the cams on, rotate this over, and measure out the valve lash, and it should end up within the uh, 10 to 14 range on the exhaust and 6 to 10 range on the intake. Usually they'll change up or down about a thousandth. Uh, sometimes they'll stay in place, but... This is an easy way to make adjustments on the bench. This is done on the valve grinder. I've already looked at the valve seats on this thing. Even with 140,000 miles, they look perfect. The guides are perfect. I'm not gonna do a valve job on this. I only have half of the engine anyways. There's no sense in going through and making one head look brand new when the other head's been still on the engine and it's untouched. So here we're on the valve grinder. This side of the valve grinder is for grinding the valve tips. I'll do this dry, it'll help keep things a little bit cleaner since I'm just doing a mock-up right now. This dial here is an adjustment that allows me to cut a very specific amount of material off of the valve tip. I'm not gonna be using that today. Since I'm only gonna make a very small cut and I'd like to have a little bit more precision, funny enough, I'm actually only going to 
set the valve up into the v-block and i'm just going to lightly butt the stone right up against the valve i've got a very good feel for this and it takes quite a bit of practice but i can cut off about a thousandth real easily if i want to um, i'd struggle to do that using the dial so i made two cuts there that should be about two thousandths when I measured the valve lash on the bench, I measured 9,000, so hopefully I can slip in 11,000 feeler gauge into place and I can move on to the next valve. Pretty straightforward process. Go down the line. Once all, val all the valves are done, you can assemble the head. Generally, I can nail this within a thousandth or two. This is pretty common in the rebuilder world. In the high performance world, we wouldn't cut the valve tips. We'd leave them alone. That way all the valve heights are remain unchanged. And we'd go ahead and just replace the shims or replace the buckets. And the added expense is what it is. But for rebuilder stuff, grinding the tips helps keep the cost down. And it's time efficient. You don't have to stock any shims. And it's a very good way to adjust valves on the bench within reason. But I've got no springs in the head. I'm taking the valve, putting it up into the guide. I'm using my fingers and I'm pushing up on the valve and pushing them up into the valve seat. And that simulates some of the spring pressure. And from there I can slip in some feeler gauges and get a really good idea of what the valve lash will be like uh, assembled. 10 to 14 is my spec. Here's 9 thousandths, slips right in. 10 thousandths, slips right in. Now I'm at 11. And remember I was shooting for 11. Slips right in, no resistance. Let's try 12 and it stops. So I was able to nail 11 thousandths on that. Originally this valve was measured in at 17 thousandths, 3 thousandths out of spec. Now I need to work my way down the line, get all these valves adjusted, and then we can assemble the head and get onto the next project, which I am pretty excited to share with you. So I was threatening to make a Porsche 944 video I've, I have other things that I need to work on, like this. This is an old SVT focus head. After talking to enough people, it seems that this engine used to be a sealed engine from Ford. That would have ended up in, inside of a race car and raced in, in some kind of a spec series where the engines all had to be the same. Uh, for the most part, these engines would have been exactly what would have come inside of an SVT focus or Escort ZX2. Minus the dry sump, oil pan, and then individual throttle bodies for an intake. This specific head is going to end up inside of a caterum. It'll be a big, naturally aspirated deal. Race gas. A lot of custom parts going into it. I spent some time cleaning up the downdraft porting bench that I bought. Got the lights replaced. So now I can see what I'm doing. I'm not making a mess of the floor every time I grind on something. It's really quite nice. Now these SVT focus heads were really a piece of work. You know, this is a little rough right now. A lot of times I'll do a burr finish. A lot of the guys that follow me on Instagram know that's kind of my thing. This will end up getting sanded since it's a pretty high-end race deal. This is really a miracle compared to what they uh, started off with stock. Here's the... Stock intake port, it's really not that bad, but there's some chunkiness here that I really don't want to see. The bull areas need quite a lot of work. The short turns are pretty atrocious. Compared to stock, it really worked a miracle. Intake port's not exactly done. I've still got some revisions I'd like to make. But before that, uh, I want to get this put up on the flow bench. I've already ground most of the exhaust port. Really worked a miracle on those didn't think to film before I made it this far, but I did take some pictures. And this is a far cry from how these ports started out. This is pretty close to the final port shape. I think I'm happy with that. There's some bumpiness I'd like to fix. We got some one millimeter oversized valves to go along with this. These are valves that I got from SI Valves in Simi Valley. Beautiful pieces. Very light. These are one millimeter oversized. I've got to make up a custom spring kit. I'll probably end up buying something from SuperTech Performance. And I've got Faith at Webcams grinding us a custom set of camshafts. The bottom end is a 2.2 liter stroker. 
mostly using a big bore, but it does have a little bit of extra stroke ground into the crank. Race only deal should make around 210 horse, 220 horsepower, naturally aspirated. And since this is the internet, you guys are gonna go nuts over this. We've got a four stack to go on top of it. I believe this comes from Borla, uses a DCOE pattern. So it worked out really nice. I'll probably end up flowing it with the intake attached. So that'll be cool. Initial flow numbers that I'll come up with will be with an unported, unmatched intake. Generally, these come in at low 200 CFMs and then uh, on the intake and then the exhaust, I believe they're about, they run out at about 160, 170 CFM. I'd like to be well over 300 on this, but we'll see how this turns out. My intake port needs quite a bit of work still. Uh, this is only my first iteration. I've only done two iterations on the exhaust port. I'll probably leave the exhaust port alone at this point. The intake still needs a little bit of work. The floor flares up right at the entry. That's not gonna matter so much, but still could be a little bit of a concern. Don't have any room to go up, uh, so I'd probably end up going wide, but we'll see what happens. Pretty happy with the turn here. I'm not really a big fan of the floor flaring up, but the airspeed's pretty slow, slow down there anyways. We are going one mil over on the valve job. I'll be able to fit a nice clean three angle valve job in there as well with some more defined angles. I could fix some of these lips on the exhaust side. So there's still a lot left on the table as far as valve job and final porting is concerned. And once I get this flowed, I can send that data over to webcam. We can pick out some cam lobes Get those cams ground. This will end up going back on the shelf. Maybe we can do some videos on mocking up the new camshafts, figuring out what we need to do for a spring kit and whether or not we need to machine this for oversized lifters. Uh, essentially, we're gonna end up modifying every single aspect on this head is what I'm anticipating, but we'll see what, what it looks like in a couple weeks once those, head, once those camshafts come back. When I first got into this industry, I worked at a production shop. I was supposed to be a welder. When I got there, never did any welding. Not even once. What I ended up doing was I'd assemble heads all day long for eight hours. Now it seemed like a pretty good gig. It was pretty fine. You got to see really a wide variety of engines, but this was in a pretty rough part of the country. You know, you can only work on so many 1.7 Hondas and 4.7 Jeeps and Chryslers. Uh, you know, TBI Chevys. 3.3 Dodges, regular engines for the regular plebeian. It really wasn't that interesting. I did the best I could. I was always itching for more, you know, so I did my best. I'd observe, watch, I bought textbooks, made friends, asked as many questions as I could. You know, and one day I found myself sitting my bench, kind of not really knowing what to do. I was out of work. Now the shop wasn't out of work. There were probably 30 heads sitting in line waiting to get worked on. Except that shop only had one machinist. It wasn't exactly a small shop. Five or six guys working there, but do the math, 30, 30 jobs in line at one time, but only one machinist. You have six employees. What's the deal with that? The owners of this business like to do this thing where you just hire the cheapest work and not teach anybody anything. Keep everyone replaceable. Well, here I was. I had no work. Out of the goodness of my heart, I walk over to the machining area, the one machinist was doing valve jobs and he had a pile of heads sitting on a shelf, all valve jobs, ready to be washed, ready to be surfaced. And I asked him, I, I said, hey, can you show me how to use the surfacer? He shows me how. It's pretty simple with the equipment that they had. So I go and maybe there were five or six sets of heads on the shelf. I get them all surfaced. Took about 10 or 15 minutes per pair to get them surfaced. And boom, an hour later, I had six pairs of heads on the shelf to assemble. From there on, without talking to anybody, I went out of my way. And every time the machinist would have heads valve job and sitting on the shelf, I'd go walk over there, help him out, and surface all those heads and do the final washing. And from then on, I was pretty hooked. I said, I'd like to learn some more and just doubled down on all the reading, question asking, learning that I could possibly do. You know, and this is very early in my career. Eventually I go and ask for a little bit more responsibility. I'd like to learn 
how to use the seating guide machine, like to learn how to do valve jobs, do valve guides, and I wanted to become a more well-rounded machinist. You'd think the answer would be, oh yeah, no problem, we can do it a little bit at a time, you know, or sure, I can start teaching you, no problem. That would be a pretty standard re response. No. The response was, oh, you're not ready for that. You need to get really good at assembling heads. Maybe in another year or two, I could start I could start you on doing valve guides. Maybe I could start you on, uh, on disassembly or, you know, whatever menial task that he was talking about. It was all crap. This was long before I learned that that shop didn't train their employees so that they'd be replaceable. So I was pretty naive in those days. I didn't really take it at heart. I went, oh yeah, that's that sounds about good. I'd like to learn some stuff, but yeah, that makes sense. Didn't really think much of it. The machinist, on the other hand, a little frustrated at those comments. He'd been with that shop for a very long time. He'd seen people come and go. He understood the dynamic. Me, on the other hand, figured I'd go over my employment history just a little bit while I was doing the valve adjustment, but you know what? I think I'll just leave that shrouded in mystery. Everyone on my, in my comment section thinks I'm a charlatan anyways. These old Toyotas use the same valve lock as a Honda. Well, well, well. I haven't forgotten how to do a valve adjustment. So in mock-up, I was getting about 12 thousandths, 11 thousandths. Ended up hitting 12 thousandths all the way across. You know, don't get me wrong, it's not perfect. Some of them were a loose 12, some of them were a tight 12, but 12 nonetheless. Uh, let's see, 13 thousandths gauge. No matter how hard it push, doesn't go in. 12 thousandths. Tight 12. 12. 12. Loose 12. Let's go backwards. Come on. Twelve thousands again. Loose 12. Loose 12. Thirteen doesn't go in. And then cylinder one. Thirteen doesn't go in. Twelve. Tight twelve. I'll take it. Here's one of those shims. Since we didn't get a good look at the actual shims off this engine. And there is what a Toyota V8 bucket looks like. The shim just sits right on top of the retainer. And it's captured by this little counter bore here. Since I kept everything in order, they only need to go back in their home. You know, it's funny. The YouTube videos are really quite a lot of fun. I knew eventually it would get around to my peers. I had one of them call me up the other day. And, you know, he didn't seem to appreciate the satire aspect of some of them, especially all the short videos. If any of you have seen my short videos, you'd know that they're not very serious. Uh, they tend to be pretty much just satire. There's some fact sprinkled in here and there, but generally it's just satire. I get a kick out of that. It's kind of my humor. I like some dry humor, or I like something that's just a little on the ridiculous side. But you know that all the long-form videos are gonna have quite a bit of good factual information, and I try to educate a little bit. You know, and funny enough, the uh, 
description on the YouTube channel says that a lot the videos may be satire. But unfortunately, that's not enough for some people. And that's okay. No, so this friend calls me up the other day. I thought it was to laugh about the videos. But in reality, he was coming to uh, tell me how offended he was at some of them. You know, his exact words were, you're disparaging the industry. Which I don't know how that's the case, but... You know, to each their own. I think there's the, been the really bad dynamic amongst the older engine machinists, where they try to do a lot of seek, a lot of gatekeeping. And I don't think the ins and outs of this profession need to be covered under a veil. And that's my whole goal with this whole channel. Some of the good parts, some of the ugly parts about the profession. Hopefully do a little bit of edu educating at the same time. My part of the industry gets to expose me to a lot of cool projects. I get to work on stuff that some people only dream about getting to work on. I think that sharing some intimate details about what happens in this job is only going to make the consumer just a little bit more educated than they would have been otherwise. If some of it comes with some negative feedback, then it is what it is. As far as I'm concerned, any attention, even if it's a little bit of negative attention, is good, only going to be good for the industry. And based on the analytics from YouTube, I'd say that the negative responses are, are really the minority. Man, I made a mess. It only took me all day long to get this thing mounted up. Look at all those tools. I should put them away. So, you'll see me go back and forth from the Flowbench to my computer. I haven't hooked up my data acquisition to the Flowbench yet, so I'll, I'll have to manually input any data that I collect off of the Flowbench into the computer, and then it'll do my conversions and come up with my CFM number. But on the bright side, the head's mounted. Look at that. I had to borrow a fixture plate from my buddy Rich at TEM Machine Shop. We're going to flow this on a three and a half inch bore. Made up a little four valve fixture. Everything's all set up. I'm about to flow the exhaust. Throttle bodies look good. I did shine a light down the intake ports. The intakes are quite a bit undersized compared to the head, so there will be quite a bit of port matching. But as a baseline, this would be a good reference. Then we'll see what happens once the intake's been port matched. I'm pretty confident I'll be making some revisions on the intake port. If I can crack 300 CFM, I'll be pretty happy with this. I'm actually quite pleased with how the exhaust turned out. I was only able to open the valve to half an inch. I'm okay with that. I should have taken the valve stem seals off, but it is what it is. I'll, I'll pull them off for the second run. Maybe I'll be able to flow it to 550. But here's the flow numbers. Stock, the exhaust ports max out at about 130 CFM. We're doing pretty good. Let's see if we can't break 300 CFM on the intake. Something tells me that's going to be no problem. There's a shot looking down the intake. You can see how much smaller the opening is. I'm going to have to do quite a bit of port matching to get this to work. But what a beautiful piece. It's quite a long runner. Look at all that taper. This is going to be fun.
Well, that thing's a turd. Well, something's not happy. This port was whistling the whole time. Not only that, the intake flows the same as the exhaust. You know, like I said earlier, the intake port's not finished uh, and also doesn't have a valve job in it. I'm really curious what's gonna happen if I take the intake off and uh, put a little clay on the port and just flow it like that. I'm almost willing to bet that there's a uh, that there's a restriction here at the intake, but we'll we'll go see. Okay, so we're gonna do a second test on the intake. The manifold is off, and I've just got clay on the entry. I think I set myself up for failure. I got lazy and didn't want to cut the seats. I just wanted to get some a baseline flow number. Well, I had these new oversized valves. Well, they're clean. I'll drop them in on the uh, stock seat. It's not going to be a big deal. Well, I noticed the valve doesn't really fit the valve seat, but I went ahead and floated it like that anyways. I have a suspicion that that's why it killed the intake port. Or at least it's a contributing factor. So, we'll try out the stock valves. At least that's going to fit the valve job that's already in the heads. As you can see, they fit a hell of a lot better. Ignore that spark plug. I couldn't get the right spark plug today. Nobody had a uh, spark plug for a Ford Z-Tech in stock. So I ground the stock valve, put a nice fat back cut on them, which is what I'll end up doing to the aftermarket valves after the new valve job is cut. At least that'll give me an idea of whether or not I'm on the right track. I'm not surprised. I've probably got four or five hours into designing the exhaust port. I think I spent 30 minutes screwing around with the intake port. Not surprising that it needs some work. Let's get this back on the bench. Let's see what happens. And here's a line graph just for reference. This second line is with the intake manifold on. This line is with the intake manifold off and I had clay on the port entry. We've got to go on a little bit of a journey and figure out what this head wants before we can widen up that gap. In a previous video I mentioned I didn't want to get into the flow bench, not at least until I had the mental capacity to do so. This is why. This is the rabbit hole. And I'm going going in deeper. I should have got inside by now, but here we are. I just changed the intake valves back to stock, ground a back cut on them, Let's reflow this, let's see what happens. I have a suspicion it's gonna pick up airflow. Oh boy, this is gonna be one of those heads that's gonna fight me the whole way. But I was on the right track. Now that I've spent some time getting really familiar with this intake port, we'll cut a valve drop in it, do a little bit more grinding and some actual shaping, and we'll see what happens. Here's an observation here. This head stops flowing right around that 300, 350 mark. What a mess. So I think if we get this mid-lift number up, we'll naturally pick up some, uh, some of the valve lift all the way up to clear to 600, even though our camshaft only goes up to 430. I'd like to see this port at least remain stable up until 600. Right now, I know it's not stable because it's whistling at me. Well, this isn't over. I'm not going to let an old Ford beat me. Unfortunately, that happens to be a lot of what I do these days. Working on old Fords. I must be a sucker. You know, and I had some theories. I thought some of the noisy port issues that I had had to do with the divider. Well, I, I put some material into there, some clay, thinking, okay, I'll blunt that off, see what happens there. That I actually ended up killing the port. Then that's not, that's typically not what's going to happen. Uh, another issue that I thought I was having was this floor goes straight, then dips down really hard right in the middle and then flares back up right before it gets to the valve. And I thought, well, maybe a little, of a little bit of epoxy on the floor might help. So I put some clay on the floor, raised that up, and straightened out the port a little bit more. That helped marginally. It raised the uh, low to mid-lift numbers and then dropped the uh, flow numbers up top slightly. It's not really enough for me to want to pursue that path, so I probably won't put any epoxy into this. Uh, one thing it did do is it quieted down the port quite a lot. So that was an interesting observation. Not really sure what to think of that. I need to get in there and uh, get some velocity readings. But I think a lot of my issues would go away with a valve job. So I'm going to get this set up into the mill, cut the intake and exhaust seats and this one cylinder, and we'll go from there. You know, I, and I walked into this with an expectation thinking that I could make this work like a small Honda. And on the exhaust side, yeah, sure, that's not a problem. I got the exhaust side to work really well.
But the intake side, I think it's going to fight us. I did a little research, found some numbers that were published by some other people, and we are right in line with what other people can do with these heads, but I think there's a little bit more on the table. So we're going to do some experimentation, see if we can't do that. We might not be able to get the intake to exhaust ratios spread further apart like I'm hoping that we could. If that's the case, then that's all right. On the intake side, we're still about 30 to 40 CFM up everywhere compared to stock, so I'm still pretty okay with this. It's just, I'm not a big fan of heads that have uh, intake and exhaust ports that flow the same, so we're going to do our best to fix that. It is what it is. It's all part of the fun. I've wasted weeks of my life on this machine working on the same head and the rabbit hole goes deeper well i thought since the flag cutter was in the machine already i'd go and deck this real fast then i can get the fixture in and cut those seats i also thought that since this is more of a european ford i could reach out to one of my british friends and ask him a couple questions well after he figured out what it was he was no help check this out here's what he had to say about this thing and well i thought i'd be polite I know you've got a wonderful plate of beans and toast sitting there. I know you'd like to get back to enjoying it. Well, that didn't go over well. This is what he had to say. Fucking baked beans on toast and all that lot. No way, mate. Living the life of luxury here. Just had steak and new potatoes for lunch. Shortly after, he cussed me out and hung up the phone, and that was it. Asking the Brits for help didn't work out. I think they're still bitter that we don't recognize the authority of the Queen. We'll see what we can figure out. A little bit of American ingenuity. I understand why you left early, Jason. This is fun. That stuff down there, not my style. There's Porsches everywhere. We're the only fools with these old trucks. Porsches, Porsches, Porsches. Not my crowd. But 944. There are way too many people here, dude. <laughs> this, is <laughs> this is not my thing. Wow. 935? Uh, 960. No, hiding inside the tent? Wow. Is he trying to tell me? Look at that. Why do I do this to myself? I hate this so much. I gotta say, <laughs> as reluctant as I was to come here, it is pretty cool, but I'm not into it. I know that car. Well, that's the last time I need to see a Porsche tractor. This is, this is crazy. Eat your heart out, Nick. Okay, here we are back on the project. It's been about three days. I had to go to Ren Sport. It's been a busy weekend. The flow bench broke. All kinds of crazy stuff happened. It's not gone well. I don't know that I've taken an entire week to film a video, but it is what it is. Here we are. Side note. The engine for my Suburban showed up. This is a big 8.1 based engine. Ignore the brackets. I'll get those cleaned up and powder coated. But this is a uh, whoa. This is a big stroker motor, 535 inches. Really cool setup. These drop into GMT 800 platforms. Should make about a uh, 740 foot pounds of torque. Well, at least that's what they make at the crank. If this thing makes 500 at the wheel, I'd be pretty happy. On the engine dyno, they make about 680 horsepower in this configuration. It will be very stealthy. I painted it Ford gray so that it would look like a Jasper motor. You know, California, you've got to have some plausible deniability. Yes, Ossifer. It is stock. These things start off as propane engines. Convert them over to gas, CNC port the heads. Put good parts in the bottom end. Works out good. And to the dismay of the internet, I'm replacing an LS3 with it. 
it's kind of hard to see. Everything's a little on the dark side. If you get a good look at this, you know, we don't have a bottom angle. It's just a straight 45, then a top cut. I want to say that's about a 30 degree top cut. I'll find a cutter that's maybe 32 or 35 degrees. Uh, I'm going to have to go deeper on the valve job quite a ways since we're regrinding the stock cams. The oversized valve is almost the diameter of the stock seat. So I'm not going to go right out to the edge of the valve. Um, and then I'm going to end up sinking the valve about 15 to 20 thousandths to get my valve job in. That'll give me a nice long top cut. Should get a nice defined bottom angle. If there's enough room, I'll come in with a fourth angle and just break this edge. Otherwise, I'll do it by hand. If all goes well, if I made the right decision, then I think we'll be able to pick up 15 CFM with the valve job. I cut a valve job in to the exhaust. I've got a 35 degree top cut, a 60 thousandths wide 45, and then I came in with a second cutter and put a small radius into the exhaust, into the bottom cut. That should help pick up some of my mid lift numbers. Now let's go ahead and do the intake. <laughs> This is what I have in mind for the intake seat. We've got a 35, 45, 52, and a 70 degree. Should work a little bit better than the stock valve job. We've moved it out to the new valve head diameter. Now we're actually going to be able to flow this head with the oversized valve. So I just need to go ahead and cut the other seat, then I can get it back on the bench. We can see if we're going to be heading in the right direction. I do have some other cutters that we can try just in case this wasn't the right move. I'm not cut down to my full depth on intake or exhaust. I'm actually going to backtrack and put some new guides into this. I uh, didn't realize that this had an odd valve stem diameter, so I'm going to have to put new guides into this to get to work with the pilots that I have. That fits a little better. I think I'll cut the intake quite a bit further down. Got a little bit more top cut. I like how much top cut is sticking out past the uh, exhaust valves. I will say it's a lot quieter. It's no longer whistling. So even if it doesn't pick up any airflow, which I think it is, uh, we'll see when we compare the numbers. Even if it didn't pick up any airflow, it'll still make it more power because the port's going to be more stable. got some pretty uh, noticeable gains here. We'll go pull the graph up in a second, but right around 450 thousandths, uh, the port started whistling again. But up until that point, it was really quiet, which before it was whistling from the beginning. So I'd say that's going to be an improvement. Uh, and we can see that in the numbers, actually. I have lots of friends who are a little bit smarter than me. I can give them call and lean on them a little bit. Maybe someone will have a solution for me. We made some big gains on the exhaust. The valve job picked up quite a lot. We got an easy 15, 15 20 CFM all the way across. Uh, mid lift numbers got picked up quite a lot. It's interesting, the intake didn't really respond to the valve job as far as CFM numbers are concerned. But while it was flowing it, it was audibly quieter. Uh, so we, we did help improve the port stability quite a lot. Let's go take a look at the computer and see exactly what happened. Now what kind of gains can be had out of a stock Ford ZTEC head? Now this would have been maybe a 2003 Ford Focus SVT. It's a 2 liter dual overhead cam. That's the hot rod one. Real fast. Very, very common in Europe apparently. So we're going to be looking at the pink and yellow line first. Max CFM happens at 160 CFM. The exhaust maxes out at 129. Take a look at that graph. They're real strong in the low numbers. As soon as you get past 200 to the 300 area, they start to fall on their face. For a four valve head, this is pretty poor. You know, a stock Honda, like a B-series, we'd be flirting with this 300 number pretty easy. The exhaust ports, now let's take a look at the ported numbers. We're topping out on the intake at 233 CFM. That's happening in the 5 to 600 range. If you notice here, it starts to fall on its face from 4 to 5, and then we start to pick up again. Right in this range, the port was whistling. So I've got some port instability that I still need to figure out. I'll do that off camera. I, I'm going to get real nerdy trying to solve that issue. Once I solve this, this will pick up and we'll fix this curve here. 
The valve job was worth quite a lot. I'll show you comparison data from before and after the valve job. We made some pretty huge gains here. As far as our big numbers are concerned, we started off at 129 CFM. Now we're maxing out at 207 CFM. This is the data that I care a little bit more about. Average CFM on the intake before porting, before the valve job was 139.4 CFM. And then after porting, and after our new valve job, and mind you, we put in one millimeter oversized valves, we picked up over 44 CFM. I'd say I'm pretty happy with that. And then the exhaust is quite phenomenal. We picked up almost 60 CFM. I'd say out of the, out of anything on this head, the most intuitive was working on the exhaust. The intake though, I probably spent about two days screwing around with that thing, trying to get it to work. Now, while these numbers aren't very strong compared to, compared to other platforms, we could get these numbers to pick up if I change the dimension of the port at the flange, but I'm not willing to do that in this application. Mind you, everything everything that we did to change this port is just in the short turn, bowl area, and in the valve job. Other than that, I did some shaping in the divider areas, uh, a little bit of shaping on the roof and the floor, but not anything too dramatic. So let's take a look at the numerical data. So here we go, we've got the stock intake port, Maxes out at 160 CFM, average is 139.4. Now we've got my port design, that maxes out at 233.3 CFM and averages uh, 183.1. And this is the unobtainium Ford Racing intake port. That maxes out at 201 and averages 161.4. Compared to stock, we're up a lot, especially once we get up over 250 CFM and above, we've got some huge gains. 40 to 70 CFM all the way across. Compared to the factory Ford port, we're doing pretty good. From 250 thousandths of lift and up, we're seeing a 30 to 40% gain in airflow. When I walked into this, I thought I'd be able to get this intake port up over 300 CFM. After working on it, I really struggled for several days. Early on, we realized that we would not be able to get it to happen. You know, at, at, there was another time where I went, okay, let's go for 250. Put a valve job into it, got the valve job. All it did was it gained a few CFM here and there. All in all, quite pleased with how that turned out. Now I called a friend of mine on the East Coast. They've got a lot more of these running around. His exact words were these forward focused cylinder heads were uniquely bad. I believe him. Now we're on to the exhaust ports. Just like the intake side, the exhaust side was really bad right out of the box. You know, we're struggling to get over 130 CFM. It would get there, it would but it just doesn't have the balls. Here, take a look at what this port looked like before any grinding. Ugh. Pinching off half of the port probably wasn't the smartest idea. My, my buddy on the East Coast, he told me that Ford didn't do any real engineering on this thing, clearly. They just made an head for an car. Funny enough, in America, the version of the version of the Ford Focus that got this engine was the performance version of the car. With a little bit of grinding, we were able to get pretty close to my final numbers here. But look at these gains. Everywhere. From 150 thousandths of lift and up. And we've got all the way up over 30 CFM, all the way up to almost 80 CFM worth of a gain. But percentage wise, what do you got? 27%, I see a 59 here. Our mid lift numbers, those are what, 57, 56, 54, 57 again. That's pretty good. You'd struggle to do that on a lot of V8 heads. I don't think I did it enough justice. There's something about the Ford Racing head that just walked all over mine from, from low lift all the way up to mid lift. Let's look at that. All right, so the first column is my port. Second column is the Ford Racing port. At 150, I'm at 112.9, basically 113. Ford is at 125.8. I just, I don't know what they did. I wish I knew what they did. I probably have some ideas, but eh, I'm just speculating at this point. Now, if we look at the percentages, 50 thousandths, 100, 150, 200, 250, 350. Half of the measured lift, Ford's walking all over me. Only after that, I'm able to beat them out, but <laughs> by nothing. Two CFM, not even two, maybe three, but not really. Three CFM under 5 CFM all the way across. I was able to get the numbers close enough to, to bring our average number together, but Ford had something figured out, I didn't. But I'm sure they had many of these heads at their disposal to grind on until they figured out what they were gonna use for their CNC program. I only had one, so I'll give myself a pass.
I put in a nice little three angle valve job and then came in with a second cutter and turned the bottom angle into a big radius. And the valve job that I used was a 37 degree top, 45 degree seat cut, 60 thousandths wide, a 52 degree bottom angle, and then I came into the radius. This is what it did for me. From 50 to 150, valve job didn't do a whole lot. 5 CFM, eh, I could live without it. From 200 and up, we really woke up this port. And not only that, the actual sound it made on the flow bench was a hell of a lot quieter. You know, and I'd venture to say, I'd really rather have a nice and quiet port than a port that flows a bunch of air and is whistling or is noisy. I could tell you apples for apples, the quieter port will make more power. And, and that has to do with how stable the port is and the, the how stable the airflow going through the port actually is. From 200 thousandths all the way up, we're going anywhere from... 18 CFM to 11, that's a solid gain. That's 10%, especially in the midlift numbers. A 10% gain in the midlift numbers, that's really good. I'm all about it. Look at that. 5, 13, 11, 11, 9, you get the point. See, I started filming last week. Look at those dates. I would have had this video ready for you guys last week, but I just had to go to Rensport and go uh, hang out with all the Porsche snobs. And since I'm still a little closeted, I'll never admit to being one myself. So here's all the valve job was able to do for us on the intake side. 3 CFM. Just 3. And I'm okay with that. That port was dead quiet up until this area. And before, it was loud. It just screamed and whistled from here to there. After the valve job, dead quiet right from the beginning all the way to the end and right about here it started to fall on its face and start getting loud again and after this it got quiet and started flowing air again three cfm four and a half that's pretty solid basically nine very solid six 3.6 3.6 nothing 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 three this is the point where i tend to throw in the towel once i get to the point where i make big changes and it stops working, I have to start doing little tiny changes and get really careful about what I what the next move is. More times than not, if I keep going down this rabbit hole, I'll end up killing this whole port, and then I end up wasting all that time that I spent trying to get here. Don't chase a number. I walked into this with a number in my head, but after realizing, okay, we're not gonna get 300, we're not gonna get 250, it is what it is. I'm right in line with my intake and exhaust numbers with what other people are able to do. Right in line with what Ford was able to do themselves. I'm okay with this. This is going to work out perfectly. And more importantly, I've got both ports flowing very stable. We've got cams picked out, and that actually is exactly why I'm on the flow bench trying to figure out how to make this head work. Because we needed to be able to pick the right cams to work for this application. And even after all that work, I still have to port the intake. Remember at the beginning, this thing, as soon as I bolted it on and flowed the head, it killed 10% of my airflow all the way across. The other thing I've got to do is fix the instability at four to 500 on the intake ports, come up with a spring pack, get guides put into this, finish the valve job, get it assembled and mocked up with the new camshafts, determine whether, whether or not I've got to put an oversized lifter into it. The list is still quite long at this point. You know, fall is here. Racing season is going to end. The deadlines are going to come up pretty quick. It can be kind of stressful, but this is the life I chose. So here we are. We got to look at Toyota valve adjustments. We spent a little bit of time developing on the flow bench. I've got some more stuff lined up. I'll see you guys maybe next week. It's been a little bit hard to film and post. Life's been a little hectic lately, but it'll be okay. We'll have some more stuff posted. I've got some good plans for you guys. And thanks for watching. This was a long video. I had a lot of fun. And I'll see you guys next time.